Uh, next, I'd like to uh, introduce um, the two next speakers. Dr. Craig Evinger is a professor of neurobiology and behavior and ophthalmology at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Um, he's been awarded the Donald Lindley Prize in Behavioral Neurosciences by the Society of Neuroscience, which is a very uh, important prize. He uh, has a long interest in facial movement uh, disorders, and he's a member of the Medical Advisory Board, and I, I really appreciate him joining us today. He'll also have another um, interesting talk in the afternoon regarding uh, animal models. And then I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Tanya Stefko, who was nice enough to interrupt her vacation in South Carolina and fly back at 4 o'clock this morning to give this uh, talk. So thank you, Tanya. Um, uh, she also has an interest in uh, facial spasm disorders, has a large practice here uh, in Pittsburgh at the University of Pittsburgh. She, she did a fellowship with Neil Miller, who many of you know, and and then uh, not as germane to this talk today, but she's really uh, internationally known for her uh, work in skull-based surgery, uh, which is essentially self-taught because she's developing it herself. Uh, but uh, thank you for, for being here. All right, so as, as uh, Dr. Sakula pointed out, this is really going to be a tag team presentation. I'm going to discuss the tear film that covers the cornea and how it interacts with blinking, and then Dr. Stefko is going to more than ably take over and explain to you about some of the therapeutics and treatments for dry eye. So let's start with the basic problem. Why do you get dry eye in the first place? And the reason that you get dry eye is because in the far distant past, one of your ancestors moved onto the land. All right. Now, it turns out if your cornea stays moist when you live in the water, you're never going to get dry eye. Fish don't have dry eye problems. But when you move on to the land, you have to keep the cornea moist. And so you have to develop a way of keeping it moist, and that's going to involve creating tears and using your eyelids. Okay, so the, the first thing is for mammals, they came up with basically a three-layer tear film. All right, and so you have what's called a mucin layer, which is mucus. Then you have an aqueous layer, a water layer. That's what we usually think of as tears. And then you have an oily mucus, another oily layer, which is covering the, the aqueous layer. All right, so let's think about them one layer at a time. The problem is the cornea, the cell membranes are basically oily, right? And when you put water on oil, what's it do? It runs off, right? Water and oil don't mix. And so the problem is, how do you keep the oil? How do you keep these? How do you keep water on the cornea? And the solution has been that you create mucin, okay? And that's done by gob. Gl it's easy for me to say goblet cells, which are in the in the whites of your eyes, okay? So what happens is, mucin has two parts. One of it's a protein part. And that attaches to these microvilli right here, your cornea, although it looks smooth. In fact, it's very, has lots of little fingers on it and things like that, okay? And that can bind to that. And on the other end of the mucin are sugars, right? And everybody knows sugars dissolve in water, okay? So by creating this molecule, now the aqueous layer 
can hold on to the cornea, right? Because it's tied in with these sugars that are on the far end of the mucins. Okay? So the mucins allow the aqueous layer to bind. Right? Now what is the aqueous or water layer? Right? I'm a real office fan. Dwight Schrute is absolutely right. The aqueous layer has tons and tons of stuff in it. It's not just water. Okay? You have approximately 40 different proteins. Think about that. There's tons of stuff floating around in your tears. Okay? And there are lysozymes. Those are ones that attack the cell walls of bacteria. Lactoferrin, again, upsetting bacterial growth. Lipocalin, it activates uh, viral DNA. And then you have some growth factors that help promote the, uh, help promote the growth of the, uh, support the corneal cells. So one thing they clearly do is tear proteins protect you against infection, right? Because you've got this eye out here, and you've got something in it, and it's exposed to air all the time. There's lots of bacteria and stuff in the air, and how do you keep your cornea from getting infected all the time? Well, it has all these proteins in it that help beat off those infections. In addition, it has immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins also are things to beat off infections. Now there's a third thing that's really important here. And that is sodium and potassium, salts, right? You've got to have salts. I mean, everybody knows their tears are salty. And why do you need salts? Well, the problem is, think about your cells. If you have lots more salt in your tears than you do in your cells, okay, then the water from your cells is going to flow out to the tears, because your osmosis, which is what they call it once, the same amount of salt and water mixture inside and outside cells. So if there's too, many, too much salt, water flows out of your cornea, that obscures your vision. On the other side, you can have it where there's too much salt, there's too little salt in your tears, and then water is going to flow out of your eyes and into you. So you want to avoid those two things. And so you have the salt and the salt layers there to keep it so that water isn't flowing in and out of your corneal cells. That's the key. All right? So now you've got the aqueous layer. Now where does it come from? Well, it comes from a gland up here called the lacrimal gland, which is really sort of sitting on the back of your, back of your eye, essentially, way back here. So it isn't, obviously, so you can see it on your, on your, cornea, or on your uh, skin right here. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that works in a minute. But that's secreting the aqueous layer and all the various proteins and things that are inside it. OK. Now, what's the problem with the aqueous layer? Well, it's really, really thin. It works out to be about 1 5,000th of an inch thick. All right? What happens when you have a thin layer of water in any kind of environment? It evaporates. So how do you keep these tears? from evaporating. Well, this is where the lipid layer, or the oily layer, comes in. And at the base of your eyelids, you have some glands that are called meibomium glands. And they produce a oily substance, which is called meibum. But basically, it's just oil. And so what you do is you coat your entire tear film with a very light coating of oil. Right? And what's that oil do? It prevents some of the evaporation, or it slows the evaporation. But the problem is, it never lasts very long. Okay, so each time you blink, and we'll get into what the blinks are actually doing in a second, your tear film is perfect. You've got a nice lipid layer, water layer, and the mucus, which we won't talk too much about, but the water and the lipid layer. And that stays stable for about 10 seconds normally. After that, the lipid layer starts to break apart. Now think about, you've all seen oil on water, right? You know, it's, it's the oil starts to pull apart. Then you get exposed areas of water, OK? When that happens, you start to get tear evaporation. If you wait about 20 seconds, enough is evaporated so that your cornea is exposed. And when your cornea gets exposed to air, it hurts. I mean, that's why, you know, when 
when you were kids, you know, you had these contests, the staring contests, you know, how long could you keep your eye open, right? Well, after about 20 seconds, it starts to hurt. And so, you know, it's the tough kid who doesn't mind his corny, you're completely drying out, that always wins those contests. Okay, so we got this. So now, how does the brain know, this is the real qu critical question, how does the brain know that the tears are evaporating, right? So you make more tears, release more tears through your lacrimal gland. And you've heard, oh, sorry. Let me show you what tear film breakup looks like. So you can put fluorescein in the eye, which is just a substance, and it shows you the lipids, this oily mybum layer. And you'll see in a second, when a person blinks, you'll see it completely sheen green, okay? All right, go back. Let's try again. Oh, don't do this to me. Okay, it's, uh, it's hiding in here. All right, so at any rate, trust me on this. What you would see is that after a, bl after a blink, it would be completely smooth, and then you see little holes popping up in it that show up as black. And that is where the lipid's pulling away, and now it can evaporate. The tears can evaporate under there. Okay, so how does the brain know that these are evaporating? Well, it uses the trigeminal system, Dr. Hallett mentioned to you earlier, okay? And when you look at the trigeminal system, it has signals, carries nerve input from all over your face. Virtually all your sensations from your head come through the trigeminal system. And all of them from the eye, except for vision, come through the trigeminal system. And so they flow in from the cornea don't like masks. Okay, they flow in from the cornea, down these nerves, and they go into the trigeminal nerve nucleus, which is part of your brain. So here's the big part of the brain you see, the back. This part right down here, called the trigeminal nerve nucleus. And this monitors your tears, and it does this in a really clever way. You start thinking, how would you monitor tears? You know, could I have some device, some receptor that monitors wetness or something like that? Much cleverer. So what happens when you have water on your skin that evaporates? What's it do? It, it cools you, right? I mean, that's why you sweat, to cool off. So this is exactly the same way. As you start to get those breaks in your lipid and some of that fluid starts to evaporate, what happens? Your cornea gets cooler under that one little spot. And your trigeminal system recognizes that and sends, that, sends the signal to make more tears. So here you're seeing, this is the signal coming in from your cornea on the trigeminal nerve. It's right here, okay? It's coming to this trigeminal nerve nucleus, and that goes to another nucleus called the superior salivatory nucleus. Don't worry about it. Just know that it runs your lacrimal gland, right? That's that one that's going to pump out tears. Okay. So, all right, we've got this. So how does the blink tie in? How do you make the blink work? Well, it turns out that those same neurons that go to make tears also drive the blink system. So at the same time you're putting out tears, you're blinking. Okay. That makes perfect sense. So now you've got this great system. So what's, what's the blinking actually doing? Well, it's doing two things. First is it's reforming the tear film. Okay, now that's the easy one because it's really, you know, you think your eyelid's closing. It's just like a windshield wiper, right? A windshield wiper clears your, you know, and it just spreads the tear film out evenly, nice and cool. The other thing it does is it gets rid of extra tears, excessive tear fluid. Okay, and the way it does that is through, through this lacrimal sac and this what are called la lacrimal caniculi. I can't say these words. These are really hard words, all right? So think about what's happening when you start to blink, okay? They're right here in the, these, this lacrimal sac, right? It's the one that goes down through your nose. But they're right here, right? So you pump a lot of tears in. Your lid starts to come down. So as it closes, it blocks off these puncta, right, where the tears are going to drain. And then because this lacrimal sac is sort of tied up in the orbicularis muscle, 
As the orbicularis muscle squeezes, the one that closes your eyelid, it basically squeezes the tear out of there and it, it empties it out. It's like it creates a vacuum. Okay, so then when your eye starts to open, these puncta become open and it's like you've got this vacuum. It's like you're pulling these tears in. So all these extra tears get pulled in like that. So every time you blink, you know, you're thinking that it's boring. It's actually doing a lot of stuff, right? You know, the windshield wiper and it's sucking off all the tears and debris and stuff that you don't need on your eye. Okay, that's all well and good. So, dry eye. Now, why would you have dry eye? We can think of at least two reasons, and I'm sure Dr. Stefko can give you lots more, but two obvious things that everyone sees, right, is that you're going to have dry eye if you have, you're making too few of the aqueous part of the tears, or you're not putting out enough lipid to hold them in place. So either way you do it, the end result is the tears break up faster. You start to get these holes, and so it's your evaporation, and if they evaporate too fast, you're going to get discomfort in your eye. Right? So what do you need to do to compensate for that? Well, you can do that with your blink system. Okay? And so what you want to do is increase the frequency of blinking. Right? You want to blink more frequently, and you want to increase the excitability of the trigeminal system. Right? Because the trigeminal system is the one that's sensing when the tears are start, when you start to need more tears. So you want to do both of those things. So let's look at what happens you look at. Now, here I'm stimulating the superorbital branch of the trigeminal nerve, and Dr. Hallett was telling you about that. Right? It's a nerve that's up here in your forehead. Okay? And instead of showing you the activity of the orbicularis muscle, what I'm showing you here is the position of the upper eyelid. So here it's open, it closes, and then opens again. Okay? No great shock there. Now this is what happens before dry eye. This is what normally happens. After you get dry eye, you don't just get, with the same stimulus, one blink, you get a whole series of big blinks. Okay? These are additional blinks. So one of the things you can see as the blink system is learning, as the trigeminal system is becoming sensitized, you're starting to pick up, learn new patterns of blinking. So instead of a single blink, now you're making a whole bunch of big blinks. All right? Now, the other thing that happens is excitability increases. And how can you measure this? Well, Dr. Hallett showed you exactly where he was talking about deficient inhibition. Okay? And the way to think about that is, Every time you blink, right, you're rubbing something across your cornea. You've got air going through your eyelashes. Now, if I were to do either one of those things to you, you'd blink, right? I mean, those things make people blink. So how do you keep from when every time you make a blink, making another blink and, you know, it never stops? I mean, you guys wouldn't appreciate that, right? So how do you do that? Well, the simple way is the trigeminal system turns itself off, becomes less sensitive immediately after a blink. Okay. And so when you do that, you end up with, if you give two identical stimuli, which is exactly what Dr. Hallett was showing you, you get a reflex blink, and then the next reflex blink, the test one, is much smaller. And so you can measure excitability by comparing the amplitude of this test blink with the amplitude of this condition blink. Okay, you just do a ratio of the test divided by the condition. Now this, is, this would be typical for someone before dry eye. And in fact, actually I think this is me. And so, but I can create a dry eye. And the way we did this was actually make it harder to blink. And we actually just put a weight on the eyelid. Right? I just attached a weight to my eyelid and hung it back over my ear. And <laughs> you thought we didn't know how to have fun in a lab. So what happens after you do that, you take it off after about 30 minutes. Now what happens is all of a sudden when you give the stimulus, now you're getting those additional blinks we talked about before. And when you look at this blink, it's larger. The ratio between these and these is larger. And here's the example. They're just superimposed them. So you can see that this ratio is much larger 
So, and then plus you're getting these additional blinks like this. So the excitability here is increased. Okay. So what I want you to think about here is that several things are going on. About sort of basic structure here so you can understand where Dr. Stefko is talking about various treatments. The tear film has these three components. The mucus, which keeps the water on, the water, and the oil, which keeps the water from evaporating. Now the trigeminal system is critical in all this because it's monitoring the system and it's causing tearing and blinking. And the blinking is doing the windshield wiper thing and getting rid of excessive tears and debris and all the stuff that's on your eye from wandering around in the air. And the key is with dry eye, and I'm going to talk a lot about this this afternoon, the blink system learns a new pattern, and learn is the key word here, it helps compensate for this inadequate tear foam. All right, so I'm going to give it to Dr. Stefko here. 